thank you very much, Frank, for that very kind introduction. And thank you very much to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow for awarding me this great honour and privilege. And I really do regard this as a privilege, and I hope that the, over the next 30 minutes I will do the great man justice. So here he is, Sir William McEwen, 1848 to 1924, one of the most leading lights in surgery in the United Kingdom, but particularly in Glasgow, known as an innovator, an educator, a teacher. As Frank's already made reference to, many people say that his great success was because he adopted assiduously the principles of Lister with regards to antisepsis. He was particularly keen on accurate scrubbing, sterilization of instruments, and the wearing of gowns. William McEwen was born at Port Bannatyne on the Isle of Butte, and this is the house where he was brought up. And I should say that I'm very grateful to Mike McCurdy and the archivist at the Royal College of Physicians in Glasgow for some of these slides. And I was fascinated in preparing this talk to find this picture. And this is Ardbeg Road, and the house where Sir William McEwen was brought up, that house, is just there. And this picture was taken in 1900, and my own godfather, who was also called John McPhee, was born there. And what's further remarkable is that in the war memorial in Port Bannatyne, there's a John McPhee. So it gave me a certain affinity for this talk and for William McEwen. He had an awesome career. He qualified from the University of Glasgow in 1872, obtaining his fellowship two years later. In 1892, he was appointed Regis Professor to the same chair that he, that Lister had occupied when he was a student. He was a fellow of the Royal Society, an honorary FRCS from England, a knight and a companion of the Order of Bath. His achievements were simply awesome. Remember, this is around about 1900. He performed the first successful intracranial surgery. He was an innovator in the use of bone grafts, an innovator in the use of hernia repair, pneumonectomy, endocrine intubation, and as mentioned, list of techniques of antisepsis. So he wasn't afraid of looking at different areas. He wasn't concerned about specialization. So why, you might ask, why ethics, professionalism, and surgery? Well, I could have adopted a number of uh, McEwen's teachings to base a lecture in his honor something to do with antisepsis, something to do with innovation, something to do with research. But I decided on ethics and professionalism because it's a subject that I've been interested in for many years, and there are aspects of McEwen that led me to, be, uh, to, 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 to use this as a further incentive. Let me explain. Here's McEwen with his team. It illustrates the fact that he was a man of great knowledge. He was a teacher. He was an educator. All these are attributes of a true professional. These are osteotomes. The significance of these osteotomes is they're all made of metal. There were no wooden handles, as was the standard practice in those days. They were made of metal because it facilitated sterilization. He was an innovator, another, uh, another aspect of being a professional. And these unfortunate youngsters with dreadful deform bone deformities were part of his common practice, and they illustrate that McEwen was a craftsman. And here is a child, as we've heard, he worked in the children's hospital with a cleft palate. Now, it may be an apocryphal story, but the story is that prior to Sir William McEwen operating on this child, he went to the child with a feather, and he put the feather inside the child's mouth, and he tickled the child's mouth, and he said, that's what the stitches will feel like after your surgery. And what I think that tells me is that Sir William McEwen was a great educator, a great teacher, and a great innovator. But he's a man who cared. He was a healer, a doctor as healer. And we don't hear much of doctors as healers. And that's what I want to focus on in this lecture. So why ethics, professionalism, and surgery? Every day we hear that surgery as a profession is being deprofessionalized. We're told that physicians are being relegated to being union-orientated corporate people whose only interest is cost-effectiveness. What I want to do in the next half hour is look at professionalism, how professionalism has evolved, which is in inextricably linked with ethics, and I want to 
outline the threats to professionalism such that we can understand these threats. And I will conclude on an optimistic note because I don't think professionalism is dead and I think it will survive in the future for future generations. So why ethics? Ethics is not new, but it's rarely talked about in surgical meetings. Ethics. Well, Socrates and Plato, they taught it. They taught it and talked about it. Buddha, he thought about it a great deal. Jesus, another great thinker who influenced very many in the West. And Muhammad, who influenced a great many in the East. Sir Thomas More, who lost his head about it. Machiavelli wrote a book about ethics, and his name's been mud ever since. Oscar Wilde took the mickey about it. And these four characters, Marx, Lenin, Hitler, Marxi Tung, they didn't give a monkeys about ethics, and look where that got us. And then Gandhi. Gandhi was a great ethicist, and he took on the might of the British Empire, and ethics prevailed. But my interest in ethics, my personal interest in ethics, goes back to this. This is Tony Bland. Tony Bland was injured in the Hillsborough Soccer Stadium disaster in 1989. He suffered significant, serious, anoxic brain damage and was subsequently diagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state. His care was taken over by a chap called Jim Howe, who was a consultant geriatrician neurologist in Airedale in Yorkshire. Now, as it happened, I knew Jim Howe for various reasons, and he knew of my interest in nutrition. And so this, I discussed this case with Jim on a number of occasions, although I was not personally involved in his care. Jim went to the local authorities to seek permission to withdraw the tube and discontinue feeding. But this was declared would be judicial murder, and so permission was declined. Eventually, the case went to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords in 1993, three years later, gave permission for the tube to be withdrawn. Tony died 10 days later. He was the 96th and the last Hillsborough Soccer Stadium disaster uh, uh, victim. The coroner declared accidental death. He was the 96th victim of the Soccer Hillsborough disaster, but he was the first right to die case in the United Kingdom. And whilst the legal judgments were long and complex, there are two that I want to draw to your attention, and they're shown here. Medical decisions should be made in the best interests of the patient, and artificial nutrition and hydration constitute medical treatments. Now, this is not just as simple as it seems. Best interests does not mean just achieving a net physiological goal. Keeping somebody alive, after all, is achieving a physiological goal. But the concept here is best interests are what would the patient have wanted were they able to express a view themselves? So if one is in a, what's called a persistent vegetative state, if the courts decide that the individual would not wish to be kept alive, then it's legal to withdraw or withhold medical treatment, be it nutrition or whatever else. But from my perspective as a surgeon who's always been interested in nutrition, it was fascinating that artificial nutrition and hydration were recognized as being medical treatments. In other words, the instigation of the withdrawal in nutrition has the same ethical constraints as dialysis or antibiotics or cardiac resuscitation or whatever it might be. So that gives us an ethical approach to a patient with a persistent vegetative state. But what about patients that have been under my care with these ethical dilemmas? A 32-year-old male who's clearly cachectic with Crohn's, but also obsessive compulsive disorder. He lived off baked beans. He refused to have any further help. A 72-year-old with a cerebrovascular accident who's aphasic. An 82-year-old with recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. You can see the effects of previous radiotherapy. Should we feed these people? If so, for how long? And if so, how? And an answer to these dilemmas requires a little bit more investigation into the theory and the background of ethics. So I'm going to give you a history of ethics in about three minutes. It starts with Hippocrates about 2,000 years ago. It's unlikely that Hippocrates was a single individual. It's a school of thought. But what we've taken from that school of thought are three fundamental principles. That of beneficence to relieve suffering, 
of non-maleficence to do no harm and to refuse to treat where medicine was powerless. They even had arrogant doctors in those days. And the next great step in ethical history, as agreed by most ethical students of ethics, was this man, Thomas Percival. Thomas Percival was a physician, a scholar, a theologian, a Christian, and he worked in Manchester Royal Infirmary here. And he was involved in many problems in Manchester Royal Infirmary in the management of patients with typhus. And there was much competition between the th surgeons, the physicians, and the apothecaries. As a consequence of his experience, he wrote a, 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 a treatise which was called Institutes and Precepts that govern the practice of medicine. And in this treatise, there are certain fundamental principles. He asserted the moral authority of physicians in service to others, that really is altruism. He affirmed the profession's responsibility to care for the sick, and he advocated self-regulation. Thomas Percival's point was that the welfare of the patient is governed by the good and virtuous behavior of doctors. If you like, this defines what we might have in the past called paternalism. The doctor knows best. You can trust the doctor. Such was the impact of this man that this treatise formed the basis for the ethical code for the American Medical Association in 1847, 40 years after his death. A remarkable man. And then the next real episode in the history of ethics relates to the Nuremberg Code, which, as you know, resulted from uh, experimentation during the Second World War. And the fundamental principles of the Nuremberg Code was to define autonomy or self-determination, the patient's right to know, right to choose, and the right not to be harmed. And so there's a paradigm shift from paternalism to the doctor-patient relationship. And most contemporary thought puts most emphasis these days on the principle of autonomy. So that gives us a brief background of ethics, but what I find fascinating is that there is a remarkable symmetry between ethics and what we all now to consider to be the attributes of a professional. The, the approach to ethics can be summarized as a four principles approach if we add injustice, which is the fair and equitable provision of resource to war. And this was first outlined by Beauchamp in 1972. And these shouldn't be seen as a rigid uh, framework, but more as guidelines. And they allow you to say, well, can we do this person any good? And what's the optimal way of doing him good? And does this patient agree with the treatment we want to give? Or does he wish to decline the treatment because he doesn't see there being any net benefit, not best interest? Or if someone is terminal, is it right to instigate those therapies that may not bring about immediate relief? So we have these four principles. And as I've just said, the remarkable phenomenon is that the principles of ethics have an amazing symmetry with being a professional. If we look at what most students of professionalism would uh, recommend or advise uh, as being the characteristics of ethics, uh, the Hippo Hippocratic tradition has led to the professional recognizing the importance of beneficence, maleficence, and morality. The influence of Percival has been knowledge should be used to serve others, that consideration to colleagues is critical, self-regulation is critical, the value performance above reward, the principle of altruism, restriction to an area of expertise, must be training in exams, and the Nuremberg Code has left us with autonomy and patient rights. And that in a way defines what is commonly thought to be a professional a core possession of knowledge and the occupation that one is professes to be skilled in and to follow. So there is this very close interrelationship between the behavior of doctors, the skills of doctors, the knowledge of doctors, and the, the, uh, the culmination of that is professionalism. So if ethics and professionalism are inseparable, and if they're the bedrock of being a doctor, and you're all doctors, why is everybody so pessimistic? What are the threats to being a professional? Why is it that we are so gloom and doom about all of this? Well, let's look at the threats to professionalism. The first is almost certainly trade unionism. 
The terms professional and professionalism are not the same, although they're often used interchangeably. They are elastic terms with slightly ill-defined meanings. And I'd ask you to consider this in all debate. The professional is based upon a knowledge base. In association with that knowledge base, the professional will offer his services wherever possible, will follow the Hippocratic ideals that I've made reference to. The essence of a professional is he's a healer. The doctor is a healer. He's aware of social justice. Self-regulation is critical. Standards of education. And the associations and the colleges have a remit to look after this aspect of you as a doctor being a professional. And I don't think that's changed. In contrast, professionalism is different. Professionalism is concerned about targets, specialization, it's self-protected, it's doctors saying I demand to do this because it's my right to do this. The professionalism promotes self-interest. They're interested in terms and conditions of service. And these are the guilds or the unions. And we need to separate these two functions because to muddy the waters merely muddies what we think about what is important about being a professional. The next threat to being a professional is evidence-based medicine. Now, the, the traditional paradigm by which many people in this audience would have trained, I certainly did, was that clinical foundation provided the foundation to treatment. You became experienced, you then got more and more experienced, and then you used your knowledge of pathophysiology to make a judgment. In other words, you start off as a baby medical student, and you gradually get more and more experienced, and in, in association with that, your peers look up to you because you become more experienced. People value the experience. The analogy is that when you are a toddler, you look up to your parents as the fount of all knowledge. When you're at school, the subject master or mistress is the fount of all knowledge. When you get to university, it's the professor that's the fount of all knowledge. And when you go into surgery, the consultant is God. He or she knows everything. But that paradigm now has shifted. The new medical paradigm is that these things will feed in, but they're not actually critical. And what we're looking for is empirical evidence based upon clinical trials with appropriate methods, so-called evidence-based medicine. But this clinical trial, the manner with which we worship the randomized controlled trial or the meta-analysis has certain downsides to it. The, the, there is now an obsession with this as being evidence Doctors no longer say, I think so, or I suppose so. They say, I know so. Also, these, these trials lead to evidence that, of course, is in the public domain, the, the Cochrane Review. And doctors and clinicians and managers and the public worship at the altar of the Cochrane Review because they think it gives them knowledge to act appropriately. So evidence-based medicine um, has its serious drawbacks. Uh, a chap called Sir Clifford Olbert in 1906, who was a physician, uh, so we're bringing in physicians, you'll be pleased to hear, President, was the man who introduced the clinical thermometer into clinical practice. He was from Leeds. And he said that the greatest threat to progress was conformity. The greatest benefit to progress was, this, was, the, was the cynic, uh, the skeptic. We have to be careful that we don't fall so much in love with evidence-based medicine that we all become conformists. The next threat to professionalism is specialization. And I'm a specialist in some aspects of my work. But the fact of the matter is that generalism now has low status. If you go to a cocktail party and say you're a general surgeon, you're not as much in favor with the girls as if you say you're a specialist. It's a fact. There's more money in specialising because people focus in on something that they feel they will be in demand for. And modern society has come to venerate the specialist as a proxy for better. And there are big drawbacks with this. Specialism now is now causing harm. Specialism is breaking down continuity. We now have health professionals reticent to make decisions outside their speciality. And this leads to a creeping paralysis of medical systems. We have, it's not in my clinical area response, which leads to endless internal referrals and unnecessary tests. 
Specialist opinion now dominates guideline development, leading to the unfettered and unjustified extrapolation of specialist trial results to generalist populations. Specialisation promotes medical tribalism, with the gangs aggressively defending their own little turf. Specialist opinion has become law. This is a method of knee reduction that was common at the time of Hippocrates. I only show it to remind you that nothing much has changed in orthopaedics in 200 years. But I also show it to talk about specialist procedures. And I'm reminded that the chief executive of the organization today said, no doubt you'll be talking about a triumph of technology over common sense, a term I used for a paper I wrote, thanks to Nick Markham, who may be in the audience. And this is an example of triumphs of technology over common sense. All these, laparoscopic colorectal, natural orifice surgery, and so on, all these are recent technological advances, which are very specialized and which are all designed to bring about improvements in patient care. But the primary driver is to improve the technical aspects of care. And I would just put it to you to bear in mind that most surgery is not technical. The next threat to professionalism is what I call the implicit contract. The implicit contract is a triangle um, of equal forces between society, the medical profession, and the state. And it was created, really, following the inception of the National Health Service. And implicit in this triangle was that society received high-quality health care that was free. And they received this from the state. They trusted the state. And the state took the view that because the medical profession were providing this high-quality care, that they would pay the medical profession well, and most importantly, most critically, they would allow the medical profession to self-regulate. The forces between these three were in equilibrium for many years. The patients were happy, they trusted the doctors. The state was happy, they had health care, and they didn't have to worry about it. Even the doctors were the ones who were responsible for rationing, hence the waiting list. But over the past 15 or 20 years, this equilibrium of forces has started to become disrupted. We have the legal profession now who are constantly arguing about litigation and so forth, which undermines the trust between society, the patient, and the doctor. We have arguments that people come out with about reforming self-regulation, and we've got declining public trust in the profession. All these scandals that you're well aware of, Bristol, Shipman, Alday, and so forth, all the stories about the so-called botched surgeon, all these serve to undermine the trust between the profession and society. And concomitant with this, we have politicians increasingly wish to meddle with this trust between the profession and the state. And so organizations such as NICE, National Clinic Assessment Center, and so forth, are all attempts by politicians to take away the independence of the medical profession. And that's now led to lots of conflict between the two. So there is conflict now about self-regulation between the profession and the state. There's conflict with regards to rationing of health care. The profession don't want to do it. The state now do. There's a problem with it failing trust between the profession and the patients that it serves. There's a problem with health care delivered to agreed standards. What are the standards? Do we do bariatric surgery or do we not? There's dozens of other examples. And five, health care rights for citizens. Increasingly in a society that has been influenced by the principle of autonomy and patient rights, we have patients saying, it is our right to have this, that or the other. And sixth, the last one here, there's a respect for authority and legitimacy which is being undermined. So the implicit contract is a major threat to our profession. And lastly, the marketplace. When I first started talking about these sort of things, I looked back at the old literature, and there are a few interesting observations. Friedson, in 1970, said that medicine had used control over knowledge to gain a, to gain a dominant position in society. It said that it had used the power it had in society to dominate society. It had used its influence over medicine to get what it wanted. Um, it used it for its own, own purposes, not for the purposes of the patient. 
McKinley in 1982s anticipated a gradual deprofessionalization of our profession and he related it to what he called the proletarianization of medicine. And what he meant by this was that he anticipated that physicians would be reduced to competing in a marketplace on the basis of unit price and the price would be determined by the corporate interests. And Larson, he said, medicine has no thought for the, for the public good and has spectacularly failed to self-regulate. Alfred, in 1973, described a conflict between what he called corporate rationalizers and professional monopolizers. The corporate rationalizers were the state insurances or, in, or, or the states themselves. And the state, its anxiety was to have a corporate philosophy that reduced cost. It was always cost. And the professional monopolizers were the colleges and the associations who wanted to maintain the status quo. And you can never maintain the status quo. So by the late 1990s, healthcare systems around the world are completely dominated by the state, and the medical profession everywhere has lost power. And that's why you feel uncomfortable with professionalism. That's the origin of it. Let me look more closer to home. In 1948, when we had all those hospitals, the manager was described in various health service journals as being of a diplomat-type nature. What they mean by this is that in 1948, up until about then, what happened in a hospital was exclusively determined by the senior clinicians. They decided who came in, who went out, how long you stayed, what tests you had, what x-rays, and so forth. And the points about the diplomat manager were that he or she responded to what the clinician said. The diplomat manager was reactive, not proactive. He or she was reactive to what the problems were within the trust, within the hospital, I should say, not trust. And there was virtually no impact on these people from outside forces. But the fourth consequence of this was, that in those days, there was very little attention paid to quality outcome or uniformity of outcome, or making sure that care was as good in one place as in another. And the politicians began to recognize this, and the outcome was the Griffiths report. He was the man from Sainsbury's. And what Griffiths said, amongst other things, his famous quote was, that if you had Florence Nightingale with her lamp walking through the wards in England, then she would have great difficulty finding out who is in charge. So he said that the consensus management style of the diplomat had to go. And he evolved the principle of the general manager. Now, actually, it didn't work very well because within a few years, Margaret Thatcher and Ken Clark produced this paper, Working for Patients. And Working for Patients, of course, it's hidden behind the usual shroud waving that it's quality of care, but it wasn't because what became transparent was this was the introduction of the purchaser-provider split. Now, I don't want to get involved in politics, but the transactional costs of the virtues of provider split are colossal. And I'm not going to go down that path now. But what happened at the same time was we created trusts. And trust was a very clever name. The word trust was evolved because the politicians said, we are putting the care of health in the community in trust to a trust board. That's where the word came from. But actually, what happened was, we find that inevitably, that corporate interests prevail over professional interests. The clinician, over this period of time, has been neutered because the two important points of a physician, clinician, surgeon, are knowledge and the ability to apply that knowledge. And that's been destroyed with these political changes because now, as you are well aware, the philosophy in the provision of healthcare is dominated by corporate interests, hence foundation trusts and PFIs. And the situation we have now is that the chief executive officer who can hire and fire at will and who is the godlike figure in most hospitals in this country. So I've given you a brief summary of the threats and it's, it's tempting to say this is all doom and gloom. Is there any way back? Are we as professionals about to sink without trace? Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Over. We 
are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> It's good, isn't it? So just to finish in this last few minutes, I think there are grounds for optimism. I don't think we are sinking, but I think we need an understanding of the background to our pessimism so that we can confront it. I think there are two main reasons for optimism. The first is society's great need for and dependence on the healer. I started this talk making the point that the great William McEwen might have been a marvellous surgeon and an innovator and so forth, but he was a doctor. He was clearly a man who cared. And that's something that people can't take away from us, that politicians cannot undermine. And I want just to emphasise certain aspects of surgery and ethics. The surgeon, as you know, is regarded as the dominant um, autocratic figure that cures cancer or cures the perforation, the all-conquering hero, the ultimate professional. But actually, that's not the right approach to take to a surgeon. That's an old-fashioned stereotype that is not helpful. I want to share with you the ethics of surgery as first written about by Little in the BJS. And we can describe five characteristics that apply to surgical practice. The first is proximity. Proximity makes the point that when you operate on a patient, you find things out about that patient that they did not know about themselves. That as a surgeon, you are privileged to know things that even the patient does not know. You are in a unique situation. It applies to cardiologists and gastroenterologists to a lesser extent. This proximity can easily be abused if surgeons wish to do so. Proximity is not like intimacy. Intimacy is mutual. Proximity is not mutual. And then there's rescue. If you subject yourself to surgery, you are like the drowning man clutching a straw. You only subject to surgery if there is no option. Surgeons can abuse this principle very easily by over-exaggerating the benefit of their results, by saying they can cure this cancer, or they can resolve this or resolve that. And I know in my training there were lots of surgeons and lots of specialities who overrated how good they were. And this is lying to the patient, and it's, it's unethical. Surgery is an ordeal. It's an ordeal that has to be endured. It's something that takes away the autonomy of the patient. Their rights of self-determination are temporarily removed. And surgery has an aftermath. Surgery doesn't finish when you put in the last stitch or the last skin clip. It lasts for the rest of their lives. How many of you have been in clinic to see the patient with that midline laparotomy scar and you say to the patient, who did that? And they say, oh, it's that Blighter McPhee 25 years ago. They know, they remember. They remember that you've, you've altered their body image, they've got a stoma, they've lost a limb, all sorts of things. We should not underestimate the aftermath of surgery. It lives with the patient forever. And presence. Presence is a virtue. It's a virtue because it's what all patients deserve. They want to know that the person that's put them through this will care for them and be there. But presence is frequently ignored. It's the reason why there are so many complaints relating to the use of locums. It's the reason why we get complaints when you go away on holiday. Presence isn't necessarily communication. Presence is something that you can teach people. I teach my juniors that I want to hear on a text about the patients. I want them to tell the patient that I'm interested in them. I've had a text this morning about patients back home. It's important that the patient knows that you care, even if you're not there. This is a quote from Atoll Broyard, the Creole writer, American writer. I see no... He was dying of prostate cancer. I see no reason for my doctor to love me, nor would I expect him to suffer with me. I wouldn't demand a lot of my doctor's time. I just wish he would brood on my situation for perhaps five minutes, that he would give me his whole mind just once. Be bonded with me for a brief space, 
survey my soul as well as my flesh. For each man is ill in his own way. Doesn't that bring a chord? Doesn't that chime with what you feel is the way we should be caring for our patients? So don't leave your patients with your name above the bed without saying, I'm going. Or don't leave them in a situation where they don't think you're thinking about them. So I'm optimistic because I don't believe our role as healers has in any way been diminished by the last couple of hundred years or by management interference. But I'm also optimistic because I am firmly of the view that the medical profession remains a source of impartial expertise. This isn't the information of Wikipedia or from Cochrane. This is the experience you gain as a healer. It's difficult to define this. It's difficult to measure. This is Franz Ingelfinger. Some of you will know the Ingelfinger uh, Directive, which was when he was... He was editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for about 10 years, from about 1976 to, sorry, 86 to 96. And it was Inglefinger who said that anything that's been published anywhere else will not be published in the New England Journal, hence dual publication. Inglefinger was chief of gastroenterology in Boston. Inglefinger knew everything there was to know about gastric carcinoma. Sadly, Franz Inglefinger got gastric carcinoma. In an essay entitled Arrogance, recalled in his own time of need and indecision, a wise physician said, what you need, Franz, is a doctor. When he found a doctor and allowed him to tell him what to do and assume responsibility for his care, Inglefinger sensed an immediate and immense relief. This great man who knew everything about gastric carcinoma needed a doctor. This great man who'd edited the New England Journal of Medicine for 10 years needed a doctor. You are all doctors. So, Mr. President, I have five brief recommendations. All physicians should submit to self-regulation. Now, I know before you mutter under your breath, it's a paper exercise, it's achieved nothing, it wouldn't pick up shipment. I understand all of those things. But I am firmly of the view, having reviewed this business of ethics and professionalism, that we must be seen by the public to self-regulate, that as a profession we must move self-regulation forward because it will help to maintain the trust between the profession and the public. And whilst I've said much about the marketplace, bear in mind that now the public are beginning to perceive it's the state's problems that we don't have adequate health care. Look at the politicians at the moment. They don't blame us. I think that it's important to reassert our commitment to the individual patient. It's fine to have us talking about units and so forth, but we need to commit to the individual patient, and that needs to be a self-apparent declaration. All doctors have an obligation to expand and maintain their knowledge. Again, I have been the first to put up my hand and say I've been cynical about CPD and CMA in the past, but the fact of the matter is we need to be able to demonstrate to the public that we are as we are, we are knowledgeable, we are professions because we understand what our posts and jobs entail. Having lost control of the marketplace, medical associations and colleges must take advantage of opportunities now presented to rebuild trust by openly espousing a public service commitment. Let's stop knocking the associations and the colleges about what do they do for us you know, what about my terms and conditions of service? What about my contract? It's nothing to do with them. As I've pointed out, their role is to look after us as a profession. So we need to leave the colleges and the associations to get on with their public service commitment. Don't muddy the waters by criticising them for things that they have no responsibility for. And I would like to encourage that by saying we need a single voice for surgery, whether it's a UK college of surgery, a forum, etc. I don't care. But I think that we see the colleges working much more closely now, and I think that's a great thing for the future. And I hope the associations and the different specialty groups will continue to come together, because to work in silos is of no value to anyone. And finally, and perhaps most provocatively, because I think there is a distinct difference between you and I as a professional and professionalism, I think we need to embrace that. We need to stop fudging this. And if we're going to embrace that, then in complete paradox to what I've been saying as a doctor, as a healer, I think we should consider creating a British Surgical Association. This is not to undermine the colleges or in any way to contradict what I think they should be doing. 
It's to say, let's take these issues out of there. You know, we wouldn't need a British Surgical Association if we had a British Medical Association that looked after surgeons' interests. So I would leave you that as a thought. Um, Mr. President, it's been a great honour to give this lecture. I hope that I've served the memory of William McEwen well. It's been a great privilege to give this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.